Hi, I'm Jess Fields. Welcome to the show. Last week I interviewed Terry Mattingly. Mattingly is a journalist and a syndicated columnist whose column on religion has run continuously since 1988 and is syndicated in outlets throughout the country. He also runs GetReligion.org, a popular blog about religious issues, as well as being a professor of journalism uh, at numerous places over the years. Mattingly and I talked, of course, about coronavirus, but other things too, like what he's reading and where he thinks the church uh, is going after all of this and how this is impacting all kinds of faiths. I think you'll find this to be an interesting interview with journalist Terry Mattingly. Joining me now is uh, longtime religion journalist, columnist for On Religion for Scripps Howard News Service, Terry Mattingly. Terry, uh, thank you for joining me. Christ is risen. Indeed, he's risen. So, uh, Terry, first thing I'm going to take you to task on here is you often refer to yourself as a prodigal Texan, and of course, all is forgiven in the resurrection. So, uh, on behalf of all the Texans, and uh, I know you're also a Baylor graduate, come home, Terry. Uh, no, thank you. <laughs> I mean, my, my personal conviction is that if Davy Crockett died at the Alamo, instead of coming back to the wonders and beauties of Northeast Tennessee, he was drunk. I mean, that's, 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 that, I know that's about as much heresy as oh, you can boy. possibly take about the Holy of Holies of the Alamo. But uh, no, I am. Um, There's going to be some hate mail for that one. Okay, well, <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, I am a Texan. I, I, I'll always be a Texan. I speak fluent Texas. But, you know, I mean, Texas has two seasons, burnt and mud. And um, I've, once I saw the, the wonders of some other parts of the world, I spent a decade in Colorado. Of course, I think a lot of Texans think when they die, they'll go to Colorado. Uh, but I'm, I feel very, very at home here in the mountains of Tennessee. I tell people that East Tennessee is as far east as you can go and still be in the West. There's, I mean, this is the original frontier of America. And I live in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, outside of Knoxville. And that puts me about 15 to 20 minutes from the original, Cum from Cumberland Gap. One of the okay. several things that, you know, the settlers went through to go West. There's at least three gaps that people call the Cumberland Gap. But anyway, I'm right here in that region, up against the face of the Cumberland Mountains. And the Smokies, of course, are just about 30 to 40 minutes away on the other side of the Tennessee Valley. And you're right oh, next I should correct also, real correctly. Please. The Scripps Howard News Service uh, went out of business about five years ago. Uh, I'm now syndicated by the Universal Press Syndicate. Okay, okay. It's best known for years for syndicating peanuts. But um, it does political cartoons, it does commentary. And when Scripps went out of business, which was right about the, uh, the 25th year of my column, I thought I was out of, out of a deal. I thought I was done. And then my phone rang about five days later and the Universal Press Syndicate asked if they could pick up my column. And uh, so I've been doing that now. And just last week entered my 32nd year writing this nationally syndicated column that goes out to about 300 North American newspapers. That's incredible. And it's a, it's a great read. Anybody watching or listening to this has never read Terry's stuff. It is always fascinating because, Terry, you really take a fact-based approach to uh, religion journalism, which unfortunately, and we'll get into this in a second, uh, but um, the press really gets religion wrong a lot. So uh, I know you have a lot to say about that. Yeah. Um, but, but I want to start with kind of where we are at this point in time. Right now is Monday for Orthodox Christians and Eastern Catholics. This is Bright Monday. Uh, for Western Christians, it's about a week after Easter, and this will air a little bit later in the week. But we've just gone through the Easter season, uh, an Easter season unlike anything anybody yep. has experienced in our lifetimes. I want to ask you, Terry, what is your take on how this uh, unique Lent and Easter season has affected not only uh, the faithful, but, but also the institutions themselves? 
Well, I don't think we'll know the answer to that final question for quite some time. But I will say this, um, Protestantism with a big sermon and a rock band goes on to streaming video a lot better than liturgical material. And, and when you're dealing with Holy Week in an Orthodox context, you're dealing with about 500 to 600 pages of liturgy in a 10 page, in a 10 day season between Lazarus Saturday, you know, and the big show, the big service, you know, for Pascha. Um, it's an incredibly complex, dramatic flow. And everybody felt this year, like at times, like we had just been unplugged, you know, and like we, we um, our bishops, I think, made the right decision to go with having services done, but with the uh, people following it, you know, with streaming, that was painful. But at the same time, a lot of us watched some of the more obscure services done in monasteries and things and saw them done that for the first time because the monasteries put little cameras up and let people watch. Um, you can't receive Holy Communion through a computer screen. I, I heard people saying they didn't feel, that they felt comfortable making the sign of the cross while singing along during the service, but they didn't feel comfortable bowing or making a prostration to their computer. You know, I mean, it was the strange thing. Now, the church is very familiar with plagues. Oh, really? So, and very... So your position is that the church has maybe a kind of a backup plan already for things like that? Well, it, it has a whole theology related to, to plagues and things. And, of course, we know scientifically more about some of the things than they did then. And, but there were times when worship was stopped, you know, in, in earlier plagues. So this is not unheard of. I, I, was, I found it very moving that the very first Sunday that worship went online at my parish here in Oak Ridge, which is a part of the Orthodox Church in America, which is the Russian-rooted, you know, American church. They did the divine liturgy, and then at the end, they did about 20 minutes, they did a rite of psalms and prayers in the time of plague and pestilence. And this was a Russian service from like medieval, some of the language had been updated, and they put some language in it about the coronavirus and praying for the first responders and doctors and nurses and whatever. But, I mean, but the, you know, you, you heard these prayers, and you went, yeah, that's where we are. I did a column earlier. Let's see if I, if I still have the book sitting right here. Yeah. I did a column a couple of weeks ago. This was your April famous. Song. April 7th column, I think. Yeah, the uh, Apostle to the Plains about a man uh, uh, who's now being, I think, seriously considered for sainthood. Um, I'm a widower in the middle of nowhere in Kansas who was one of the first priests ordained in America um, by uh, now St. Raphael of Brooklyn. I mean, and this man was an itinerant priest at his own parish in Nebraska, but he traveled, get this, from the Dakotas to Oklahoma, from St. Louis to Colorado, was where he had parishes that he was visiting. And he died in the Spanish flu. Really? Yeah, because he, he wouldn't stop going to people to hear last rites. He kept visiting his people and he died in the Spanish flu. Now, did they understand influenza then as well as we do now? No. Does that mean that theological questions involving this coronavirus, this new virus, did our bishops today face different decisions than they did then because they know what they know now? Yes. Did they feel they needed to protect their priests? Yes. But if someone was dying at the hospital, would our priest go? Yes. I mean, I mean, this is, there are things that priests do. Um, I was talking, uh, e-talking, you know, Twitter the other day with a, a Roman Catholic friend of mine up in the Midwest. 
and he was noting that a lot of the a lot of the nursing homes won't let a priest in. So he's now having to say last rites sometimes, having the, them open the window so he could stand outside and say last rites to someone whose bed is six feet away. And he was wow. wondering, well, what should we do if it's a two-story building or a three-story building? And I suggested that in the heavily Catholic Midwest that he call up the local phone company. And I'll bet you they'd come over with a truck with a bucket, put him in it and put him up at the third floor window. If that's what it took. I mean, to get to say last rites for someone. Um, that, is so, that is so extraordinarily sad that someone who has been a faithful Catholic their entire life and the significance of last rites um, and, and really having a final confession. And yes, sure. And, and, and I mean, this is for Catholics, for, Eastern Catholics, Latin Rite Catholics, Orthodox Christians, uh, Oriental Orthodox, you want to have a priest there, right, when you're dying. Yeah. It's extraordinarily sad that well, it, this has taken that away. Yeah, and, and I personally think that some bishops... Now, see, another thing you need to remember, the bishops were working up against a very interesting reality, which was that not all of their priests were under the same laws. You had this weird, crazy quilt, especially early on, of different levels of shelter in place and different interpretations. And the bishops chose to say, I want all my priests to be under the same rule. And this is what happened in Orthodoxy. I personally wish they had let us do a little more outdoors. Mm -hmm. I think there were things we could have done within. Um, social distancing that could have happened outdoors, but they did not want con conflicts with the state over this. The other thing is that when uh, Orthodox uh, priests hear confession, there is a part of the rite that is necessary involving putting the stole over the head of the person. And a Catholic priest can pronounce an abs absolution from 10 feet away, mm. six feet away or whatever. The right is just a, it's constructed a little bit differently. Is that the same for Coptic Christians as well, Terry? You know, yeah, I honestly don't know okay. that, but I would imagine that it's the same same I thing think, as with I think it's similar the to Eastern Orthodox. So, so what you're saying is that there's a face-to-face, a, -face, uh, a personal component that, because of the distancing, is is gone. And um, you know, I I I think. Uh, that, that's such an interesting point on its own to expound on because um, I can't remember who. Some, some pastor or priest told me at some point that you can't have church without community. Community is essential. And I found myself, just before Easter, myself, um, at one point I had to, uh, I just had to drive over and I sat in the parking lot of my church for yeah. 15 minutes, you know. And uh, of course, the service is streaming on Facebook and everything, and I'm listening to it. And um, I, I'm, I'll be honest, I was a little emotional about it because I missed that experience. And I of know, course. at least for me, how important it is to be there with people that I love and care about doing something that is the most important thing um, in my life. How much do you think the community aspect of worship, but especially for these liturgical churches we're talking about, how much has that been impacted by this? And do you think that's a permanent impact, Terry? No, I, well, first of all, I don't think we have any way to know. Okay. But second, I, you know, I could think that we might lose a few people, but we might have other people who become much more active because they realize what they've had cut off. I don't think mm -hmm. we could predict what happens in the human mind and soul under these kinds of conditions. I do know yesterday, um, we, some members of our parish sent a message around and we decided to have a, uh, a Orthodox flash parade yesterday. And we got about seven, 60, 70 people in cars. And both of our priests live on cul-de-sacs, which is very common in Oak Ridge. And we, we, we drove down in and filled up the cul-de-sac and came back around. Then everybody got out of their cars and stood by their cars, you know, 10, 15, 20 feet away in some cases. And then we sang hymns 
to our priests. Really? And, and then and ask for their blessing. So you kind of did a little bit of a, a flash mob, but uh, yeah, uh, yeah. And then and and then and it, flashing my Texas credentials. We then did the perfectly logical thing. Most of us then went over and filled up the drive-through line at Dairy Queen. You know. Oh, of course. Yeah. And Dairy then, Queen or Whataburger. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We all well. There's no Whataburgers in East Tennessee. I'm sorry. Oh Lord. But then, but then we we parked two to three cars spaces apart in a parking lot and just all stood and talked for at least an hour. Oh, I mean, wow. you know, a lot of, and I thought the kids were real good. The kids didn't run and start playing together. Right. You know, they talked, they stayed close to their, their parents, but everybody stayed, you know, this two to three car parking spaces apart from each other. Um, and it, it was really touching. I mean, you know, there were some tears shed and yeah. um, I don't think, we have any idea what's ahead. Yeah. It, you know, that, that reminds me, Terry, of the, I'm sure, of course, you saw the, the story of the Italian opera singers who were singing from their balcony. Yeah. I mean, we have a, we have a natural human longing for this personal connection. And, you know, I know that there are people who say, mm -hmm. oh, you don't have to go to church to love Christ and all that. And, and I'm sure, and there are examples, you know, throughout history of, of that people that maybe never go to church, but there is something to be said for those of us who are really bad at being Christian. And I'll count myself in that for actually going to church. What other stories have you encountered maybe in your research and in your uh, uh, journalistic uh, day to day of, of this kind of thing? I'm sure you've heard about similar things from across the country. Well, there's several, there's so many layers to this. I wrote a column the other day noting that the, the, the theological puzzle that's referred to as theodicy, which essentially is like, where is God in this? And that can, for many people, can turn into what is God trying to tell us in this? I think the better response is, how does God want us to respond to this? Um, rain falls on the just and the unjust, as the saying goes. You know, I'm, I'm not going to be one of these people who thinks God sent the coronavirus to teach us something. I do believe God wants us to respond to the coronavirus in ways that teach us something. So I think the main question right here that's going to have a long-range fallout is just people trying to figure out, you know, the age-old question of, why is there evil in the world? Why is there brokenness in the world? Why are there novel viruses running around for which we have no antibodies? And, and why, why do we have to crash our economy to the level of um, the depression, right, potentially, in terms of unemployment? Why do we have to do this? Well, well, we don't have to do it. We can just let a lot of people die. And we can overwhelm our hospitals and we can kill nurses and doctors, you know, that, that throw themselves on these hand grenades. But the other thing we don't know yet, I was on a, a, a digital Zoom call the other day with a bunch of people from around the world. Folks, the ring of fire from Nigeria to Indonesia, it hadn't even started yet. And one person was saying, you know, never forget that in those gigantic cities in Africa, across Asia, India, you know, and all through there, never forget that about 40% of the population of those cities lives in slums, average occupancy of four to five people per room, no running water. Yep. I mean, it's easy for us in America to look at Western Europe and Asia and think, okay, once we beat it, it's done. But I mean, in Africa, no. Ebola, which is much harder to catch, manages to kill thousands and thousands of people. And it's hard to believe coronavirus won't spread just as easily or much more easily, really, than something like yeah. Ebola. You tell people, wash your hands, you know, 10 times a day, 20 times a day. Say that to people with no running water. Say that to people if it's a two-mile walk to the river and the river may not be perfectly clean. And as one, one person who's on the field in Africa put it, in a race between COVID-19 and starvation, starvation is going to win. You know, 
and, and he says, almost everybody I minister to is working and living hand to mouth without the wages for even two to three days. And they have no government infrastructure, you know, to, to back that up the way we do for many things here. So do we have bad times right now? Yeah, we do. Do we even have any idea what this is going to be like in the slums of Lagos? you know, or in India. No, we don't have a clue. Well, let me ask you, let me ask you this, Terry, because I mean, I had um, uh, a guy on, actually the first episode I did of this podcast and web show, a guy named Tony Spell. He's a pastor in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Oh, no mercy, you, yeah. Insisted on having services and he was arrested and he's been charged some number of times. And we did an interview and um, uh, it's gotten, that interview I did with him has, has gotten some traction. Um, he, he said some things that were certainly controversial, but he made a point that was very subtle actually about how most of his parishioners, and he has a Pentecostal church and he buses people in. Most of his parishioners, he said, are service workers and people that uh, are basically unemployed because of this situation. And they are people that already were at or below the poverty line, the working poor, some people might say. You know, there is something I think that's interesting here. It does seem like this whole situation in some ways is stratifying society or it's highlighting oh. some cracks. I yeah. mean, do you think that's a, a valid point or? That's true, but I would still answer him and ask what is his right to bring people together in that manner and then send them back into the community where they will threaten the lives of nurses and doctors, emergency responders and whatever. And people say, well, you know, Christians have died, have been martyrs for their faith. I, I raised a lot of hackles on Twitter when I put out the following equation. He said, you know, a, a Christian martyr says, I am willing to die for this faith. They don't say, I'm willing to die for this faith. And while you're at it, would you kill those 10 people too? Yeah, while I you're at Rod, it? I had Rod Dreher on um, after Pastor Spell, <clears throat> and he responded to some of what Pastor Spell said. And um, he was especially concerned about how Pastor Spell said that he wouldn't maybe tell the congregation when a person got the coronavirus. Yeah. And Dreher uh, um, sent me a message the other day, uh, I don't think he'll mind me saying this, that uh, apparently somebody in the congregation had died of the coronavirus. So, I mean, certainly there's, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's, you're playing maybe with, with fires, which you yeah. and Rod are saying, I guess, with that. Well, we, and we've read the stories of hot spots, you know, at funerals. Um, but I mean, it's kind of like the religious side of the political equation of asking, government officials in Nolens to shut down Mardi Gras. Well, I'm sorry, you're in the, you're in the economic proposition posed in the movie Jaws at that point. <laughs> you know, you're closing the beaches on the 4th of July. Uh, I still can't believe, knowing what they knew, that the government of New York let Chinese New Year's go on. You mm -hmm. know, with all those people jammed into the narrow streets of Chinatown. And that's only like a week you know, or two weeks at most before they finally did the shutdown. We also know more about that now. I've, of all the things we've seen journalistically, to me, one of the most haunting, image, haunting images was that New York Times graphic tracing the cell phone signals coming out of Wuhan. Is it Hulan? Wuhan? Wuhan. That's Wuhan. Their yeah. I, have, I have a mental block on that, the name of that city. But anyway, this indicated that just from that one city, forget the rest of China, that one city in the week before they finally locked it down, 900 people traveled to New York. Wow. Now, a lot of them surely were going to Chinese New Year or were meeting family there for that or whatever. Oh, sure. Um, how many lives in New York could have been saved if they have, had shut the city down one week earlier? I've heard people say that it would be 60% of the lives they lost. Well, Terry, I'm, escalation. yeah, I, I don't know if you've seen this. I'm sure you have, but um, there's a Texas story too to this, but recently 
there's been a couple of similar stories, as you say, about cell phone signals and tracking people about the Florida Spring Breakers. Oh, yes. Partied on the beach. And there was a story recently that of, um, of those who went to, um, to Florida for spring break. I think it was, I want to say it was University of Texas students. And that's not just because I'm an Aggie. I really think it was University of Texas students that they surveyed in this. But like 50 of them ended up testing positive for the coronavirus, almost 50, well, uh, after they came back to Texas. And think about all the places they traveled on the way after they went from the, to well, the beaches. And of course, most of Texas goes to the Texas beaches for spring break. Yes. Uh, they did the same sort of tracer thing for like two miles of beach in Fort Lauderdale. And I, of course, living near Knoxville, I noticed that some people went up 95 to the Mid-Atlantic, except most people in the Mid-Atlantic go to spring break on their own beaches in the, in the Carolinas, you know, Virginia and whatever. The tributary, the river of cell phones went up to Atlanta and then veered to Nashville about two thirds and about a third to Knoxville. Well, Nashville is one of the undercovered hotspots in this crisis. Think of all the people that stopped for gas and food and whatever in Knoxville. Well, you and you and I could talk about this forever. So, what else do you want to? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't. I don't want to. I, I know it's so easy to go down this coronavirus rat hole. It's kind of like searching the internet and just getting on a lot of topics. Yeah. So, what is the worst? coverage of religion in all of this that you've seen over the past month or so? Because you do spend a lot of time on your blog, yeah. getreligion.org, and in your column on religion, talking about journalistic mishaps with regards to covering religion. Well, in this case, I wouldn't call it a mishap. Okay. There's no question that the rebel preachers, the angry preachers, as I call them, um, there's no question that was a valid story. But I couldn't help but note that the ones who tended to get the coverage, especially early on, tended to be people who kind of, frankly, fit this white evangelical Trump blue collar Pentecostal image, and that they were getting tons of coverage, and very few people were covering the overwhelming cooperation that was coming out of not only the U.S. Catholic Bishops Conference, not only out of orthodoxy, but out of the Southern Baptist Convention, you know, and the Assemblies of God and other really important religious groups in the nation who frankly, don't you know there had to be debates among Southern Baptists over a lot of this, but they, and, and they can't order, their, they don't have the rights of a bishop, they can't order people to close down. I was stunned at the level of cooperation with shelter in place that we saw from mainstream. And the, and the way churches that had never done online worship at all dove into it, I thought that was an amazingly undercovered story. The angry preacher's story was important, but so was the 99% of the American churches that were cooperating, or American churches, synagogues, and religious groups that were cooperating. Yeah, but I didn't, uh, doesn't the angry preachers sell more papers, though, Terry? Well, okay, that's the cynical, that's the standard way of saying that. Sure. I just think it was an easier story. Okay. And also, don't forget, the newsrooms are facing the same crisis. Mm. Their people are locked in. They're in the middle of what was already a horrid economy for the news business because of Facebook and Google and everybody stealing about 90% of the ad revenue in America. Mm -hmm. We could have an entire other talk about that. Right. So there were valid reasons that journalists struggled with the story. But my point was, this was a national level, remarkable story. And writing X number of inches of copy about some angry preachers who didn't cooperate that was a valid story, but it was not the only story. I will say in the last couple of days, we've seen some exceptionally good journalism about the fact, that, I mean, the tremendous tragedy within the Church of God in Christ, the Black Pentecostal denomination, okay. which is, you, did I see something like they've lost like 30 ministers or something? Yeah, could uh, you speak a little bit to that? So some of these, some of the stories that you feel like have been well covered, what are, what are some of those? Well, that, now see, they, cover, they finally got to that one. 
and that broke up the image of the the white evangelical guy in a red hat you know who's either a trumpster or some sort of self-contradictory pro-lifer you know that wants to be pro-life but doesn't mind if nurses die you know and i mean all of that stuff we saw for a week or two things have improved in the last couple of days but um my, I wrote a post today that I, I was really miffed that the Associated Press wrote this really interesting story. It took a lot of work and they covered orthodoxy around the world of what happened with Orthodox Easter without a word about North America. And it, and it seemed to me to pound home this, well, there's those strange Greeks and Russians and crazy people in Georgia and, you know, but meanwhile, the very complex quilt of, of orthodoxy in America is not huge, but it would have been nice to have had a couple of anecdotes in there about how North Americans were handling this as well, especially since, frankly, a couple of orthodox bishops were among the very first people to make the hard decisions and get on this thing. And, and frankly, as painful as it was, I thought they handled it extremely well. So that prompts a kind of a personal line of questioning, Terry. You are now Eastern Orthodox. Of course, you have a history of covering many different religious traditions and expressions, uh, but you didn't grow up Eastern Orthodox, I don't think. Uh, so <laughs> what, what led you down that path, and what's that story? I think a lot of people would be interested to hear. Well, no, I grew up in Texas, the son of a Southern Baptist minister, who at one point was the director of Baptist ministry in North Texas. And we were based, he was based in Wichita Falls, Texas, up at the base of the panhandle. He was, the, the Baptist term is associational missionary, which basically means he was in charge of building all the missions and he was the pastor to the pastors. In other traditions, that's called a bishop. I mean, it's really in some ways how that functioned. My brother, Don Mattingly, uh, is probably the, one of the two or three best known Southern Baptist youth ministers of the late 20th century started the Southern Baptist program called Centrifuge, which many people would know. Uh, in the midst of the Southern Baptist Civil War, I like to say that was the only thing anybody did that everybody liked, you know, so <laughs> you know, that, that's my brother. Uh, I was ordained as a Southern Baptist deacon at about age 28 or 29 at a church up in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois. Um, I could tell one funny story, which, which will, I think, help tell this. I tell people I ended up Orthodox in large part because of my love of liturgical music and church history. And if you sing a lot of good church music and you read a lot of church history, at some point you're going to find yourself in 1056 trying to decide if the Catholics or the Orthodox are right. And you're well aware of the fact that Christianity existed before Martin Luther, you know, or whatever. So anyway, when in Champaign-Urbana, a friend of mine, who was an organ performance major at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. And she played her, I think it was senior recital. It might have been a grad recital. But she did this beautiful piece of music that was variations on a piece of Gregorian chant. And the name of the composer slips my mind right now. I could look it up real quick, but I'm not going to do that. But she came up with the idea that it would be interesting if she played the variations on the organ down on the stage. And then I went way up. She was the organist at our church, Temple Baptist Church. I went way up in the balcony. And between each of the variations, I sang the next verse of the Gregorian chant in Latin, a cappella from the back of the auditorium. This gorgeous acoustics. And afterwards at the reception, we were in a reception line and an older priest, Roman Catholic priest from the Catholic Studies Department was coming through the reception line. And he walked up to her and said, uh, who was the, the young man who did the Gregorian chant up in the, up in the balcony? And she waved me over and uh, introduced, and he says, so young man, what parish do you go to? And I said, uh, actually, I'm a member of Temple Baptist Church. Uh, in Champagne, and there was this long pause, and then he said, "Not for long, young man. Not for long." Ooh, and I thought that was an interesting. In other words, 
he's a, nobody who loves Gregorian chant that much, you know, and has learned to, you, you this is going to catch up with you. You don't hear that many, a lot in Baptist churches, Gregorian chant, that's for sure. Well, our Bruckner Motets, my favorite, uh, my favorite liturgical composer. And of course, there's no liturgical history, music history with Orthodox, of course, none. Um, when you're in a church where the Gregory, the new theologian is from the sixth century, um, you know, you- A little bit got, of sarcasm for the podcast listeners there. <laughs> a bit of sarcasm there. Um, so anyway, <clears throat> church history, beautiful worship. And then I can honestly say that out of the Southern Baptist Civil War era, I'm very proud of my Baptist heritage. I, I, uh, my spiritual father, the late Gordon Walker of Nashville, Franklin actually, was a Campus Crusade for Christ evangelist and a Southern Baptist minister. Um, he founded a great church in Franklin, Tennessee, and the second pastor, second priest at that church was a converted Southern Baptist. Uh, I mean, so um, there are a lot of converts in orthodoxy in this era, and um, I have nothing negative to say about my heritage and my family as a Baptist. But I started asking questions about church history, about theology. And I tell people that for me, it was a combination of an interest in a historic, ancient, conservative form of Christianity that in no way was touched by America's unique history of fundamentalism. Now, it's hard to be much more conservative than Orthodox on morality and theological issues, but we're talking culture at this point, culture and history. So you combine, I tell people it was a combination of church history and beauty is how I would explain that I made my way uh, from Southern Baptist preacher's kid to Eastern Orthodox. So what did you mention that your, your brother was uh, very prominent in the Southern Baptist Church? What, what did your family think about this when you made that, that change? Well, like a lot of people on their way to the ancient church, we went through Anglicanism before we discovered that you can't put St. John Chrysostom and John Calvin in the same pew, that they, neither one wants to be there. And the, the via media Anglican compromise doesn't work over the long haul. But so most of the questions were faced, you know, when we went out of Baptist life into Anglicanism. My parents um, were, were quite frankly, once they heard why we did it, my father saw that this had nothing to do with losing the faith. It had nothing to do with losing the basics of the faith. And my parents never hassled me a bit. Interesting. Um, so so your your parents were more concerned about just your soul overall how you and and you know and our kids and, and um i my two kids are both very very active orthodox christians and um my daughter married a brilliant young man who was on his way to converting to orthodoxy met in the gordon college uh, orthodox campus fellowship and he's a history major. Once again, you, you, you start reading history. And so he now teaches Latin and Greek and history at an Orthodox classical school in Wichita, Kansas. I'm guessing this is a son-in-law you very much enjoy talking to. I think he's a remarkable young man. So my, of their five kids, the, the girl who's in third grade is in her third year of Latin and second year of Greek. Oh my goodness, wow. In third grade. That's incredible. That's a different way of doing education from the American norm. Uh, that's, that's very Okay, so there's, that's that, that question, long answer. Well, what's the, well, well but so, so Terry, hold on. People always ask, you know, the question when you go from one tradition to another tradition, which is substantially different, that's a leap. I mean, people want to know, what did you read or what was the big question? I mean, what was, yeah. what was for you, what was that? Church history, I would say, frankly, my favorite book in the world, I read it every year during Great Lent, I just finished it the other day, right as we hit Pascha, is C.S. Lewis's The Great Divorce. Oh, wow. The, really? the question of good and evil and of freedom of will, freedom of choice. Uh, 
the overarching theological question of my life was always universalism and the belief that all would be saved no matter what, uh, with like no, I would say real choice involved in that. Now I know there's a lot of different schools of orthodoxy, but you could also see how that would mix in to the theodicy questions of good and ill, good and evil, that you run into as a journalist all the time. So there was no way I was running away from those questions. But so, I would, I don't think as many people read their way into orthodoxy as read their way into Roman Catholicism or Anglicanism. Orthodoxy is, to me, ultimately a community life. And when people ask me if, tell me they're interested in orthodoxy, I always tell them to get in a choir. Get in a choir and sing your way through the liturgical text for a year. And at the end of, if you have any musical ability at all, get in the choir and just read the stunning poetic expressions of theology that is in Orthodox hymnody. And you'll of course also work your way all the way through most of the Bible in a year and all of the Bible in three years. What you're saying is it's kind of more of a lived experience versus a, a it, logical exercise. One of the central truths of Judaism and orthodoxy and ancient forms of the Christian faith, I would put Catholicism in this as well, of course, is that we are not ghosts in the machine. We are embodied souls. And we tend to forget that we have bodies and that sometimes we lose our temper or even lose our faith for reasons that have as much to do with us doing bad things with our bodies of a wide degree, everything from lethargy, apathy, and inertia to the more spectacular sins of the flesh. That has a way of coming home. And that we, we just can't pluck the spiritual side of our life out separate from whether we're getting enough. But I think right now the coronavirus crisis has done this for a lot of people. You've got to keep your, your walking levels up. You've got to be careful about what you eat or you're just going to slide off a cliff, you know, into physical, uh, physical issues that you to some degree have chosen. Hard choices, but chosen. It, you, you mentioned uh, reading The Great Divorce every year. I must say that touches a nerve because that is one of my two or three favorite books of all time. Yeah. And uh, in The Great Divorce, pertinent to what you're saying, uh, the, uh, those who are in communion with God, uh, the, uh, the light spirits, uh, are solid and they are able to move around in uh, the heavenly realm or what is really the fringe of the heavenly realm, whereas those in uh, hell or Hades, depending on your uh, perspective, I suppose. Yeah, uh, Lewis called it the valley of the shadow of life. Yes, right. The, 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 the valley in he, ahead of the mountains. So, so you know, they, they really can't move around very well because everything is so solid and they are uh, almost like phantoms. Um, so what is your, um, what is your favorite? The, the Great Divorce, if someone has never read it, is unbelievable. I mean, it's, it's an incredible allegorical tale of these people in hell who basically take a bus and they go and they visit uh, the fringe of, of heaven. And, right. uh, and, and I think in the very beginning, uh, it's said that the door of, of hell is locked from the inside. You That's know? Chesterton. That's actually a quote from Chesterton. That's a Chesterton quote. Uh, the book does contain Milton, I believe, that the ultimate theory of the book is that there are people who will choose that it is better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. Yes. So everyone should go out and get The Great Divorce. What is your favorite... Um, your favorite vignette within the great divorce, because within the book, there's all these moments where the, those in heaven are talking basically to their friends or acquaintances from hell. And some of those are very interesting conversations and the question of whether they can convince them to come uh, and, and embrace God over their previous life and, and uh, their pride and so forth. And it's very difficult. What's your favorite vignette of those? Well, I, I think it's impossible, much like the Chronicles of Narnia, there are different books that hit you different ways at different times in your life. Fair enough. Um, you don't read Magician's Nephew. You don't hand a Magician's Nephew to someone who's just lost their mother mm. at a young age. Mm. Um, 
the Douglas Gresham told me that there, there were years that he never read Magician's Nephew because he just couldn't. C.S. Lewis's adopted uh, son, one of, one of them, after the death of Joy Davidman. Well, I mean, there's the part that always makes me laugh, and then there's the parts of the book that are just so stunning in their insights. The, uh, the one, the most haunting section of the book has to be the mother who comes to heaven to get her child to take it back, the child back to hell. Oh, yes. The, the, the subtle degree that shame and self-pity are shown to be sins that are hard to pin down. We don't like to think of those as sin, but they, but they, but they, he shows brilliantly that they are pride in disguise. Wow. And Lewis was convinced that the, at the back of all sin is ultimately pride. Yes. Yeah. Now, so what's my favorite part? The part I always gives me a chuckle, of course, is the Anglican bishop who has come to heaven, uh, but, but can't believe that he's guilty of apostasy and so that he chooses to go back to hell to lead his Bible study on the theology of hope. Right. Yeah, questioning, I mean, questioning the resurrection, right? Isn't it possible yeah. that we can uh, continue to have an open mind about the resurrection? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the thing like, well, where do you think I am? Well, up here we call it hell. You know, there's no need to be, you know, to, 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 to curse at me, I mean. Well, I'm, um, not, I'm not passing judgment on the man, but of course there is a, a very famous Anglican bishop, uh, Spong, I think. Well, uh, among others who... Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I've interviewed Jack Spong. Um, oh, you have? Yes. And uh, oh, I asked him if, if the resurrection was an event in real time, was the way I worded it. What's well, become one of the TMAC trios in religion writing. We can segue briefly here before I, I let you go. We can segue to how I got into religion writing and whatever. But yes, one, of the key, one of the key parts of all that is something that at Get Religion we call the TMAC trio. And these are the three questions that I always ask when covering conflicts within Christianity. Um, and it's not that people have to give you a specific answer. It's that you'll learn so much watching them try to avoid answering. And the three questions, the first one is, did the resurrection happen as an event in time? Wow. And notice how that's different from saying that they understood it mm -hmm. or they knew what they were seeing, but did something happen in real time or to put it bluntly did they meet their lord could you take did, a picture of it right was it was well it real so, some people yeah that's another phrase people use i would just i like the phrase it's in real time okay the second question is once again the universalism question hmm. great divorce is salvation through faith through the grace of jesus christ alone in other words this ultimate to get you christology and it gets you the universalism question. And the third question is very much a part of our day and age. And the wording of this one is crucial too. The late George Gallup once liked this wording so much he put it in a Gallup poll. Uh, because, and this third question is, is sex outside of marriage a sin? Now note that it's not illegal not the worst of sins, and note that it's not uh, the question of homosexuality. It's stated. I mean, although that's obviously relevant to the question, but uh, teaching on Christian colleges, I used to remind people, you know, we've got students on our campus doing everything but conceive children on couches in the lobbies of dorms, you know, and we're not, you know, we're not giving them a second look, but if two guys on our campus even look at each other, We've got people that want to throw them out of school. I mean, we're not, we're, we need to face the issue that for the church, the theological question is the status of sexuality outside of marriage, a sexual expression outside of marriage. And if you put the question that way, here's the important part. It's a doctrinal question, not a political question. And so when in doubt on the religion beat, I strive to get journalists to admit that doctrine exists and that it matters, instead of assuming that all questions ultimately come down to whether or not you like Donald Trump, mm. or whatever the, whatever the question is at some moment in time, that yes, politics is an important, 
important part of life. But when you're looking at the long haul in religious questions, at some point, you're going to have to admit that history and doctrine matter. Well, Terry, as we uh, get ready to close out, I want to ask you uh, to explain why you love writing about religion, because you've done it for so long. Obviously, you got into it because you, you're passionate about it. And you, yeah. could, you could briefly talk about your column and what GetReligion.org and how you kind of tie those, those things in and, and what we can do to learn a little bit more about what you do. Well, the decision to go into the field really explains, explains it pretty much, period. And I can make a, a reference to my mentor, uh, who's still alive and well, in Texas, uh, at Baylor, the, the great Texas journalist David McCam, two-time National Professor of the Year, uh, taught at Baylor until he was run off at the end of my sophomore year by the Baylor administration. Uh, McCam still reads my column, and we're still in touch on a regular basis. But here's the story. Um, during the fall of my sophomore year, I was working for the Baylor Lariat, the student paper, which the, the Lariat back then, I don't know how often it is now, but it was published three or four times a week, which is a lot for a college paper, you know, for, for a private campus. Well, a big event on campus was going to be Missions Week uh, and missions, and then the, the Missions Fair weekend. And of course, nobody wanted to cover that story because uh, you know, all of the journalists, a lot of the journalism majors at Baylor were very anxious to prove they were real journalists. That meant, you know, smoke, go hear Willie Nelson, you know, <laughs> cultivate a taste of Lone Star beer, you know. <laughs> These are the things real journalists do, I guess. <laughs> and Coors, if you could get it, you know, the, the whole bit, you, you had to show that you were hipper than now or that you were real. But I volunteered to cover Foreign Missions Weekend. Hmm. And I went to it, and basically nobody showed up. Now the people who were running all the booths and everything were shocked. I mean, this is Baylor, the largest Baptist educational institution. You know, you should have had people who wanted to be medical missionaries lined up around the block. And what I decided later was we were beginning to see the beginning of the kind of Reagan era, you know, where the business school boomed larger than everybody else put together. And, one of the critical issues at Baylor a couple of years after I left was whether you could have two cars on campus. You could have your off-road vehicle as well as your car. Two car students, um, materialism in other words. But um, I went back to the meeting and I said, this is an incredible story. Missions weekend was held Friday and Saturday and hardly anybody came. This is a big story. And the, the rest of the Lariat team said, um, well, if nobody came, it's not a story. Mm. And I said, this is Baylor. I mean, there should have been tons of, it's a, it's a story that nobody showed up at missions weekend at Baylor. Mm. And I thought, no, 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 nobody's excited, nobody gets it. And I looked up and over in the corner of the newsroom, David McCam is standing in the door going, doing that finger waggle to call me over. And I walked over and McCam said, now they didn't get this from me, but these students have already learned that most journalists don't think religion is very important. He said, I personally think religion is the worst covered subject in the American media in terms of its importance in American life to how it gets covered in journalism. Long pause. And then he said, you wanna do something about that? And from that moment on, I was gonna be a religion writer. I, I double majored in journalism and American history with an emphasis on history of religion in America. Uh, because I was engaged, I needed to stay around at Baylor a little longer. I did a, a master's degree in the Department of Church State Studies, um, which was an interdisciplinary master's degree in theology, political science, history, and law, all at the same time. We had to compete in graduate seminars in all four of those departments. And once again, I, I chose to major in history of American religion. 
uh, four years later in Urbana-Champaign, um, I did a master's degree in journalism. And since I had already worked in journalism for a while, they let me place out of some of the skills classes. And so I studied in the Catholic studies and the Jewish studies program, since I figured I already spoke fluent evangelical at that stage. And um, I studied um, post-Holocaust Jewish ethics. And I did a readings course on the work of the historian and journalist Gary Wills, specifically his writings about Catholicism in the post-Vatican II era, in the pre and post-Vatican II era. Because I figured if you could wrestle with what Vatican II had done to the landscape, you would learn a lot about Catholicism in the American context. So from that point on, I was trying to get into the field of religion writing, which I was able to do a couple of years after that, working for the Charlotte News and the Charlotte Observer. And I went from there to Denver to write for the Rocky Mountain News. And toward the end of that period of time, I started writing my national column uh, for Scripps Howard at first. And that was 32 years ago. Um, I eventually segued into teaching at Denver Theological Seminary uh, with the great um, teacher of preaching, Billy Graham, called him the greatest teacher of preaching in the history of the English language, modern English language. And that was a man named Haddon Robinson, a uh, very well-known writer, died just a couple of years ago. Haddon became my mentor going into teaching. And then from there to Milligan College, uh, teaching in Washington and, you know, and some other places. But for 25 years now, I've been teaching a journalism program in one way or another connected with the Council of Christian Colleges and Universities, um, trying to encourage more schools, more Christian schools in America to take journalism seriously. So that, do you see that's kind of like the flip side? I, I like to compare it that what we have here is a blind spot with two sides that basically we have way too many Christians who don't understand the constitutionally protected role that journalism plays in a free society. And at the same time, on the other side of that blind spot, we have far too many journalists who don't understand the constitutionally protected role that religion plays in American public life and discourse. So two of the most powerful institutions in America, the two halves of the First Amendment, don't respect each other mm. and can't translate each other. The phrase I use for religion writing a lot is that religion writing is like a combination of politics and opera. You know, it's got all of the content and complexity of politics and political discourse and canon law and all those motivations. But then there is this whole other side, which I compare to opera, which is this beautiful, at times angry, emotional, ancient, deep rooted side of all this religious discourse as well. And you can't mess up either side of that and understand what's going on in the world of religion. So get religion is a defense of the American model of the press, which says you're supposed to care that you get both sides of these debates accurately and that you respect people on both sides of these debates. And the American model of the press is very much under threat, under attack right now, both from the left and the right, I would say just as much by Donald Trump as by whoever it is right now at the New York Times, it seems to think it doesn't matter if they ever quote a named source, again, in the history of the paper, uh, or correct anything that they get wrong with religion writing. I mean, you have that wonderful uncorrected story that's still on the webpage of the New York Times from a couple of years ago that said the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is the building where Christians believe Jesus is buried. And I was thinking there might have been somebody on the copy desk who had heard of Easter. You know, I, you know just outside shot, but not, not editing that story. But I, I could name a whole lot of other fun things related to mistakes on the religion beat, but I, 
I don't feel like going there tonight. Yeah. Well, um, that blind spot with two sides is what I've dedicated the two halves of my life work to both in education and in journalism is trying to work on both sides. It's important in the American public square between journalism and religion. Terry Mattingly, thank you so much for, for joining me. Um, everyone can read your excellent writing on religion, which is very much the opposite of the blind spot uh, that you've described at uh, getreligion.org, correct? And Getreligion.org, and there's like 28 years or 29 years now of the columns. Dot net. I'm sorry, could you repeat that web address? You just cut out for a moment. T for Terry, M-A-T-T -T for Mattingly, tmat.net. tmat.net, wonderful. And of course, the On Religion column, which is uh, no longer Scripps Howard, now Universal Press Service, I think you said. Universal Press, that's what's stored at tmat.net. The blog, the 17 years of work at the blog are at getreligion.org. Great. Well, we have pod weekly podcast that I produce with the team at Lutheran Public Radio that people can sign up as well there. Fantastic. Terry Mattingly, thank you so much. Please stay safe in all this and uh, hope you can get out and enjoy uh, the Appalachian Mountains before too long. I will do my best. Thanks right. so much. And that was Terry Mattingly. Remember, if you like the show, please subscribe on YouTube or in your favorite podcast app. If you have an idea for a guest or want to be one, email me at jessfieldsshow at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.